For this week, we're going to find ourselves in the book of Jude in the New Testament. So just before Revelation, you get to Revelation, turn left, you'll find Jude. It's one small book, and a, uh, I'm going to begin by reading a few verses from the start of Jude, and then for the heart of this sermon is going to be verses at the end of Jude. So we're going to do it like old school book reports I used to do. I'll talk a little bit about what happens at the start, then what happens at the end, and then the rest is for you. Uh, so Jude, um, only one chapter. So I'm going to read a couple verses, then we're going to see uh, what God has for us in this talk of building yourselves up, according to Jude. So here's the start of Jude, and I don't have it on the screen, so you're going to have to just hear me read it from uh, here or follow along in, in your Bible. It says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. So we start off seeing who wrote this letter. It's Jude. He he is also a brother of Jesus, a half-brother of Jesus Christ, but he mentions here that he's a servant of Jesus Christ. Now, if my brothers would acknowledge themselves as a servant of me more often, it would be okay. Jude here says he's a, a servant of Jesus Christ because he wants us to see something as we go through here, the life of a servant, and to be people who are serving. It says, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. So he's writing this letter to believers who are facing a time of uh, severe testing. They might be weak. They might be in a, in a season where they need to be uh, encouraged to contend for the faith, to live out that which is true, their faith. So Jude is writing that letter with that in mind. And so we're going to see this as we go through the main text that we want to see uh, here today. But I wanted to start with that to show that he is uh, calling the early believers here and for us to contend for the faith, even at a time when it is, it's, we seem weak or we seem tested God desires for us to stand for the faith and to follow his leading and to build yourselves up, as we'll see in our main text this morning. But before we get to all of that, I want to share a little story of this Christmas season. Our family went to Erie, Pennsylvania, and stayed together at this indoor water park, and it was fantastic. It was a different change of environment for Christmas, and we spent time on the water slides and the lazy river, one of my favorites, uh, and down all these slides. But our kids are at the age where they're just super excited about water slides and can take on the water slides by themselves. And unbeknownst to us, uh, Cody had developed a strategy for his water slides to make him go faster for himself to be more uh, entertaining, more exciting. And so it was simply, no matter what slide it was, he'd sit back with his arms laid back, and he'd go down a lot faster, and he told me all about that. So he has this strategy, and then we thought to ourselves at some point in the course of this trip that, you know, what's going to be a great idea is if we could get Cody to take our youngest on a slide. The youngest, not yet two, uh, can't do any sort of swimming stuff, but let's put her on Cody so we can get a great photo of them going down the kitty slide. And I said to you already, Cody had this strategy that we didn't know was applicable to all slides, no matter who is on his lap. And so we put a page on Cody's lap, and here's a picture of what transpired. You can't really see it. It's a little blurry, but I'll discuss it in depth with you in a second. So here's how the result. Uh, there's Paige with her hands up, and there's Cody and his strategy. Straight there, and everybody's under. There's me running to the rescue, twisting my knee, uh, limping the rest of the weekend, exaggerating it, and there you have it. So Cody's strategy, he stayed with it, Paige uh, went under. Now the beauty, beautiful thing about this is that Paige, even though she went under, still wanted to go again and again on, on the slide, and we, have a, we don't have a great photo, but we at least have a photo of her smiling, thinking that she, went, she survived, and you can see the big life preserver that we have for her. And never again will she go on Cody's lap, as she told me for a slide. She told me that. Uh, but the reason I start that is because we're entering into this letter and the two things I want us to concentrate on as we go through this. Strategy and then bravery. Jude's going to give us strategy for building up our faith 
And then the bravery he's going to call for us to actually be filled with courage to go out and do the things that he has for us, the the things that God speaks into our hearts. To be brave, to go forward to our faith step by step of the way. So with all that being said, let's take a look at uh, verses 20 to 25 in uh, Jude. It's just one chapter here, so we'll, we'll read these five verses. Here's our word for this morning, and then we'll dive into it. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothes stained by corrupted flesh. Verse 24, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let's pray quickly as we receive this word. God, thanks for your word. We pray that you would open our hearts to receive it. Open our hearts and minds to understand what you might be calling each of us to do. How you might want us to hear from you even in this moment. So God, I pray your spirit would be present with us. Allow us to understand your great word and the power that's available to us. And then by your grace as we leave this place, we'd be infused with power to face what we face and to do it with courage and boldness and bravery. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So... The title is Building Yourselves Up, and Jude gives us a strategy for building ourselves up in the faith, and then he tells us, or gives us some application to doing just that. So the first thing that we say, see in building ourselves up, and what he says is to pray in the Holy Spirit. Pray in the Holy Spirit. To be people who are committed, disciplined, seeking God in prayer. Jude is saying that the first way to build yourself up in in the faith is, is to be praying. Our theme for the year is praying and courage. Pray and courage, both of those. We become prayerful, courageous followers of Jesus by spending time with him in prayer. So our first thing to think about this morning is is how we can commit ourselves to praying, commit ourselves to spending time with God, recognizing that it's in prayer where God infuses us with his power when we pray in the Holy Spirit. He leads us Through the prayers, the Holy Spirit guides us and directs us. We're going to say three specific things about the Holy Spirit in a second. But the first thing is that we pray. We have to spend time praying, committed to prayer. I want to see what Jude says. He says, we just read it. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. It's something we do and continue to do, praying in the Holy Spirit. There are three things about the Holy Spirit that's important for us as we talk about praying in the Holy Spirit. It's not an exhaustive list about the Holy Spirit, but it's good for this study to recognize these three things about the Holy Spirit when we're called to pray in the Holy Spirit. First one is this. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us. Sometimes when we don't have the strength to say words, to speak in our prayers, the Holy Spirit will pray on our behalf, will intercede between us and God. He is interceding for us. Here's what Romans says, adds to this. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. One of the things the Holy Spirit does for us is intercedes for us. So when we're praying, when we're spending time with him, the Holy Spirit is interceding and depositing into our hearts truth. The Holy Spirit is interceding. The second thing that the Holy Spirit does is he leads us to truth. He leads us to Jesus, to truth. He's interceding for us, but we must spend time with him who will then guide us in the right direction who will then take us where we need to go. 
wonder if there's any of us here who have been searching for God's next step in our lives. It's the Holy Spirit that will guide us into all truth, lead us to Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit, when we spend time praying, that will fill our hearts with these things, will give us the direction to go, and then it's us who has to step in that direction in obedience to what he says. The Holy Spirit does these things. Here's what uh, the Bible says in John 16. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will do what? He will guide you into all the truth. The Holy Spirit has been given to us as a gift, and who is one who leads us in that direction. I know there are many of us here today that are, uh, well, some of us here today that are like me and uh, what they call directionally challenged, meaning that you can't get from point A to B. Uh, you can try it 10 times, and on the 11th time, you're still confused. Where am I? Where did I go? I have no idea where I'm supposed to be. In the olden days, or not the olden days, but uh, earlier times before we had cell phones, I would be lost, and I'd call my dad, and dad would uh, Dad said, what's wrong? I said, I'm lost. And he'd ask me this question, where are you? I said, Dad, I just said I'm lost. And then somehow we'd find our way. Today we have the GPS. And in our van, our GPS is just as confused as me. So sometimes we pl plug in a direction and it leads us all these weird places that I have no idea where it's taking us. And I think that the GPS listens to me or something and becomes like the owner lost and confused on that direction. But in our lives with God, sometimes we are off the path. Sometimes we are uh, taken a, a, a wrong step, a wrong turn, have gotten lost, dazed, and confused. And God is uh, gently calling us back through his Holy Spirit into the right path. He'll lead us back to the way that we should go, and we'd follow into it. He'll call our voice and say in prayer, this is the way you should go. Follow me. And then it will require us to respond to him. He said to follow me, I'm going to take the step that I need to to get back on the right track. The Holy Spirit will lead us into truth. He'll intercede for us when we're too weak. But then he'll also, inter he'll also bring us to where we need to go. He'll point us to the truth. Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life. So the Holy Spirit, what he's going to do is point us back in the direction of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, the one who goes before us, the one who has plans marked out for each and every one of us. And we know that God doesn't give us the entire picture of where we're headed. He gives us usually one step at a time. Usually one step at a time, it requires us to be obedient to what he leads us to. And the Holy Spirit, in prayer, will point us to those directions. So our first challenge this morning is to, uh, part of this strategy Jude sets for building our faith is pray. That's the first step in the strategy. Pray. Pray at all times, in all circumstances. Pray. Everything we face, pray. Here's what else the Holy Spirit is. Third, the Holy Spirit comforts us. So we might be uh, recognizing the Holy Spirit interceding for us, pointing us to truth, then we start to take scary steps towards what he has. And the Holy Spirit will do a comforting work in us to let us know it's okay. Let us know you can keep going. To comfort your hearts. I wonder if some today just need to rest here for a moment. Even while I go ahead, maybe you need to rest here and recognize that his Spirit comforts us. What are you carrying that you need to release and allow God's Spirit to comfort us? The Holy Spirit does these work, this work. Here's what happened in the early church in Acts. It says, The church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. The comfort of the Holy Spirit. Later, Paul will say, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all Comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves were comforted by God. Through the Holy Spirit, he has provided for us comfort in the midst of uh, discouragement even, in the midst of great difficulty. The Holy Spirit will guide us to truth and then also bring comfort into our lives as we're first praying. 
praying in the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. The Holy Spirit leads us to truth. The Holy Spirit will comfort us. And the Holy Spirit does a number of other things, but for the purposes of this time today, these are the things that the Holy Spirit will do for us as we're praying and becoming a praying people. Praying will help us to build our faith in ways we could never imagine because we'd be filled with his spirit. And the prayer is what uh, sets our hearts on fire for the things of God, gets us excited, increases our zeal, makes us ready to serve him, and it becomes a contagious fire. Burning up prayer keeps the fire stoked. Last weekend, we went to the, uh, our annual men's retreat. We had two little fire things, that fireplaces that kept the place warm. We had to have a guy who was our fire guy, stoking the fire. He was so good at this. He loved it. He just got that fire just pumping every time we were there. And at one point, I saw him literally stick his hand in the fire. He's so experienced with fire, he stuck his hand in the fire. And he came out and looked at his burnt hair. I said, did you just burn your hair off your arm? But he kept the fire stoked, so we kept the place warm. The Holy Spirit in prayer will keep our hearts on fire for him. I wonder today if today might be the day where God is pulling you back to the path and relighting a fire in your heart, making you contagious for Jesus, making you full of his spirit, powerfully facing what he would uh, require for us as the next step. Holy Spirit will do these things as we spend time with him, build up a fire in our hearts for him and for his glory. So the first thing to building our faith according to Jude and his strategy, is to pray and pray and pray. We see this through the Bible. That's a, a, a storyline of the Bible. Jesus himself spent time praying, praying, praying. In fact, before he did anything, Jesus spent time praying. Before he called his original disciples, he spent the whole night in prayer. Then when morning came, he called his original disciples to him. And then they went out and served. He gave us a picture of solitude with God in prayer, community with others, and then serving. Prayer first. So our encouragement is to do that as well, to be people who are praying in the Spirit. Here's the second thing Jude says for us. Second thing is stay connected to God and to one another. Stay connected. Here's what Jude said. We just read it. Keep yourselves in God's love. It's important to notice uh, the togetherness that runs through this passage. It is keeping yourselves in God's love. There is a connectedness to us as followers of Jesus that is important on our walk with him. In other words, we cannot do it alone. When we're linked in together and strong, we're way better. When we are seeking each other's uh, good, we're way better. When we're spreading God's love together, we're better. If you've ever played this old game, they don't, I don't think they play it anymore. It probably got banned after my generation of uh, rowdy kids. But the game Red Rover, where you just link up to each other, and you, one side's on the team just linked up. The other side's on the other team linked up. And then you spot someone, and you think, Red Rover, Red Rover, send Johnny on over. Johnny's got to break his link and go charging to try to break the other team's link. And what happened most often when I was playing is the person would get their head right here, and the game was banned. And, but there was a, a linking up that we did when we were playing that game that got our arms so tight together that we knew nothing was going to get through it. And so when we're following Jesus as followers of him together, Jude says to stay connected so tight that you know that nothing has the power to get through of it because of Jesus. Because you know when you link arms together here, when we're all together, we're stronger. But if one person gets off of that connection, that one person is isolated, that one person is uh, in an area where they'll be tested, they are vulnerable, and it is uh, a co-responsibility of the linked up togetherness to get that person back together with us and that person to seek to be back together with us as well. A togetherness that goes through this. So to build our faith, we do it Together, we keep ourselves in God's love. It's important to have our own solitary disciplines, but community is a discipline we also need. 
together as we're building our faith, seeking after uh, one another and the good for each other. But he says to keep yourselves in God's love. So a few things about God's love. We mentioned the Holy Spirit. Now let's mention God's love. First is that God's love is eternal. It's never ending. Never changing. It's a love that's not based on our performance, by the way. His love for you and for me is not based on our performance for him, but it's always based on Christ's performance for us. What Christ has done for us uh, shows us God's love and makes available to us a right relationship with him because of Jesus. Here's what the, uh, Jeremiah says. He says, Long ago the Lord said to Israel, I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love. With unfailing love I have drawn you to myself. He is pointing a picture of a God who has never-ending love. It's important for us as we're building our faith to realize his love for us is deep, real, never-ending. We couldn't measure it if we wanted to. It is that deep for us. As his children, he delights in us. Zephaniah says that he looks at us and delights over us with loud singing. He's so joyful that he sees us. His love that never changes is so excited to see us as his children. He sings over us. I like to picture him just being so excited that he can't contain it and twirls around kind of love when he sees us. Well, who needs that fresh reminder today that God just absolutely delights in you? We can recognize that his love is everlasting. He's excited to see us. He's excited to see us taking steps towards him. and He's with us in it all. Here's the second thing about his love. His love is active. Active means it's doing something, or it has done something, will do something. Here's what the Bible adds in Deuteronomy. Because he loved, because he loved your ancestors and chose their descendants after them, he brought you out of Egypt by his presence and his great strength. Because of his love, he did something. He brought them out of Egypt. His love is moving, active love. It's a love that uh, pursues after us as well. Through the story of the scripture, you can see God pursuing his people. His people continually uh, turning away. Then God continuing to pursue. And then sending Jesus and completing that relationship that was broken. His is a pursuing love. It does something. It calls us toward something as well. Because it's uh, an active love, it's also our example. God's love is our example. That's the third thing about God's love that's important for us to focus on this morning. Just like Holy Spirit, God's love is way more than I can fit in this time we have, but these are the things I want to highlight for our purposes this morning. His love is our example, meaning that we go and do because of him. We love because he first loved us. That's what 1 John 4 says. It's an act of love that does something. And God, as we're uh, calling us, as we're building our faith, the strategy is to pray, then stay connected to God and his love and to one another, because the closer that we get to God, the more closer we'll be drawn in to one another as well. And God desires us to love him with all of our heart and then to love others in the same fashion with which he loved us. He fills us with that type of love. Jesus says, uh, everyone will know that you're my follower, you're my disciple, by your love. This active love that God gives to us is love that we show to others. Jesus then says also, I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Jesus is our example of this greatest love. I love the, tra the paraphrase translation that says, Jesus saying, I am your example, keep doing what I do. Meaning that we follow closely to Jesus, our leader, savior, the one who exemplifies this love so that we can also share that love with others. His love is active. His love is our example. His love is never ending. It's eternal. And Jude is calling uh, the early believers and then giving us a good reminder to uh, contend for the faith in this capacity, meaning that we contend for the faith in love. Love first. Love is the foundation for our contending for the faith in times when we feel weak and feel uh, tested. 
meaning that we show a picture of God's great love in all of our relationships, all of our interactions, and we point to Jesus because of first we've been praying, we've been filled with the Spirit who guides us into all truth, and then we go and be active about it, and we serve and we love, we contend for the faith in that capacity, that we know about Jesus and we know him personally and are able to spread that word. Oftentimes, sometimes we have uh, a way of contending for the faith in a way that's not with love, a way that's not showing love. If we're not showing love and not resting in his love, then we're not being the example that Jesus needs for us to point to him, that he's calling for us to do. You can think of it in any contention that you have. Maybe, uh, like me, you grew up in a family where you contend with younger or older brothers in all different instances, whether it be for just to uh, get the last bit of food or uh, whatever else we'd contend about. I remember one time I was, uh, we were arguing and going back and forth, and I had said something. I forget what we were talking about now, but I remember the result. And uh, so I got my older brothers agitated, which is very easy to do. We started to contend, and they'd start to chase me. And I'd be faster than them, so I could book around and around corners. I could go upstairs. I could do it all faster, because I was youngest, lightest, fastest, not yet strongest. So they'd chase me till they caught me and make me surrender. The one specific time, and, uh, they had chased me to a room. My oldest brother came. I got behind the door. I closed the door, locked it, one of the push locks. And he came flying down the hallway with a jump kick, knocked the door right over. Well, not over, but bursted up the side post of the door. And so we're looking at each other after this contention. Who was right, who was wrong, it didn't matter because what we just did was the worst. <laughs> right? And so my oldest brother, in all of his wisdom, grabbed some white out and started to fix the paneling. And put it all back together. We don't have any glue. Let's put the white out on the door frame. That'll work. We contended, and we all do that. I know we do. Ashley and I just contended recently about our minivan. We have uh, this great minivan. If you'll let me for a second, I'm just going to just get out some frustrations about this van. <laughs> we, uh, every time it's getting colder in the winter, it would f the doors freeze shut. I know some of you have that in your, in your head saying, amen, go, talk, talk to me about this. And so the sliding doors would uh, freeze shut, so I'm trying to get all of our kids in the van to go to school, whatever, with all the morning things, and you try to open the door even after the van has been warmed up for 20 minutes, and the door is frozen shut, all the doors, except the back door, really. And so we, Ashley and I, have this contention. I say that the uh, uh, electric sliding doors, if you keep that on, you can pu push it a little bit, it'll give a little extra juice and a little extra power, and the door might open. And Ashley probably rightly says, no, you have to have that off so you can actually open it and yank it harder. And so guess what happened as we had this contention? We all ended up going through the back door. <laughs> we were both wrong. You can't, it was frozen shut. Except for Paige, who I carried through the front of this front seat, lifted her over the top, and put her in the thing, make sure my body's fully over here, extended. You guys get the picture? Clicked it in. Now, when we're contending for the faith, if we do so in any capacity other than what is required of us, and that is one that is following the example of Christ, the love that he has for us, if we're contending for faith in any other capacity, we're all going to lose. We'll all lose out. But if we contend for the faith as the strategy that Jude has put out for us, to build our faith through prayer, through staying connected to him and to one another, then we'll see some major victories, in fact, Victories that we never thought possible because of who Jesus is, because of his great love for us. He is uh, leading us in that way, that we would pray and stay connected. So pray, stay. The third word is wait. Wait for God's mercy. We wait for him. Wait. It's not a very uh, exciting word for us, I don't think, that we would have to wait for anything. But Jude says here for us to be waiting, it says in verse 21, as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Waiting for us is difficult, but I believe God desires for us to hear that even in the midst of waiting for him to, to see his promises fulfilled, in the midst of waiting where we think that nothing is happening, 
God is working behind the scenes in our waiting. I wonder if that's a word for some of us today that maybe you've been waiting for a long time for God to do something. And God is calling back and saying, I am doing something. Just wait. Just wait. Just wait. Keep waiting. I know we don't like to. God calls us to wait. Part of the strategy Jude offers for contending for the faith and building our faith. Pray, stay, then wait. Wait for his timing. Wait for his purpose to be revealed. Wait for his power. Wait in two ways, both in light of eternity, meaning that Jesus is coming back. We wait patiently, expectantly that he's coming. And then we wait for what he has for us. If you've ever had to wait for God for something, you're in, in line with many of the biblical characters who had to wait years and years and years for promises that God gave to be fulfilled in his time. Many Bible characters had to wait for his promises to be revealed. And when they waited, they saw God's glory in ways they never thought possible when, it, when he finally uh, came through on his promises. We, too, have to wait. There's a great uh, article in the New York Times uh, about a Houston airport. And here's what's transpiring. I'm going to read it to you, but what transpires is people were complaining about long wait times for their baggage as they arrived for the air from their uh, plane. It says, uh, story of how executives at a Houston airport faced and then solved a cascade of passenger complaints about long waits at the baggage claim. They first, first decided to hire more baggage handlers, reducing wait times to an industry beating average of eight minutes. So they reduced the wait for eight minutes. Well, I don't know what your waiting threshold is, but eight doesn't seem too bad, but I'm sure if we were there, it might be different. We're waiting for our luggage. But complaints persisted. This made no sense to the executives until they discovered that, on average, passengers took just one minute to walk to baggage claim, resulting in a hurry-up-and-wait situation. You get the picture. It's eight minutes they're waiting, but it's only one minute where they're actually doing something. They're walking to the baggage claim. The walk time was not the problem. The remaining seven empty minutes of staring at the baggage carousel was. So in a burst of innovation, the executives moved the arrival gates further away from the baggage claims area. Passengers now had to walk much farther, but their bags were often waiting for them when they arrived. Problem solved, the complaints dropped. There were no more complaints because they had to walk that far. So don't complain, I'm going to make you walk. (laughs) Walking, they had to walk in that time. So what you see is... The length of their weight and the length of our weight in general is not the problem. It's that what we're doing while we're waiting. If we have nothing happening, there's frustration. That's what happens in this airport scenario. But God wants to remind us here this morning that in, in our waiting, in our waiting for him on a plan that he has, he is also working. So that time where it feels like nothing's happening, God is doing great and uh, important work in us during the waiting. So here's a couple things about that. First, waiting prepares us to serve. Waiting for God is an opportunity for God to prepare us to serve him. So the strategy was from Jude to pray, stay, wait. And in our waiting for his mercy to be revealed, his plan for us, he will fill us and prepare us with power to actually go out and do the things that he calls us to. So Jude will say a few things that happen when you're uh, the going part of this, the serving part after you're waiting, and all of them seem like quite difficult things to actually do because God may be calling you to something that is going to be quite difficult. The result is that you cannot do it in your own power. We have to do it in prayer, together, and then step by step with the Spirit as he leads us. But here's what Jude says. He says, be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. In order for us to actually step into the things that God desires for us, to share his love, to do uh, just what Jude is saying here, we need to be waiting and prepared by God. And it's in his timing and not ours. We don't rush ahead of him. We go at his pace and for his glory. I like the old uh, King James version of this verse that says, be merciful to those who doubt. It says, and of some having compassion, making a difference. 
meaning that you are actually seeking out to make a difference in the lives of others with this love that Jesus has for us, that we spread that out and make a difference. But the waiting part prepares us to serve. I spend some time with our Vietnamese youth every Sunday afternoon as well. We have a Vietnamese church plant here, and I spend some time with their youth. So I was telling them one time about waiting on God, and uh, one of them re- responded back to me with what has become an Internet meme, but I don't think he started it, but I give him credit if he wants it. He came back to me and said, while waiting on God, you know what you need to do? While waiting on God, do what waiters do. Serve. Waiting on God, serve. So I wonder if there are some of us here today that have been waiting on God. Waiting and waiting and waiting. And he's calling you, and you might even have heard him say, to serve. Maybe today's the day that we respond in stepping towards him. Even in this situation where there might be uh, it might be something that requires some bravery, some boldness, and some courage. It probably will. God is calling you to it. It probably will require, will require you to be brave, to be bold and courageous, and to step into it, and then to see his hand uh, guide you all the way as we spend time praying, staying, waiting. The second thing waiting does is it strengthens our faith. Waiting strengthens faith. Because in the, in the waiting and in the following and in the going and serving, we will require dependence on God and not in our own power. It will strengthen our faith, building up our faith, which is a great ending to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, meaning he's able to, as we take a step for him, it might feel like we're going to fall. He is able to keep us from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. Again, he is delighted to keep you from stumbling. He's delighted to keep you going on the path. The only God and our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority. So here's what Jude's strategy again is. His strategy for us is to pray, stay, wait. We pray in the Holy Spirit, pray at all times, We stay connected to him and to each other in community. And then we wait for him. We don't run ahead. We wait for his timing and his purpose to be revealed. And then when these things have been accomplished, this strategy has been in play, we go and serve. That's what he calls us to. That's what God calls us to in this. That there'll be opportunities for us to serve him, to serve others, to show this great love of Jesus to our hurting world, just like Jude at the time was writing to a group of believers that were hurting and their faith was vulnerable. And he told them to build your faith, praying, staying connected, waiting for God's mercy to be revealed, waiting for his at just the right time plan for your life. He does that for us as well. Now there's, I wonder if there's also some of us that have continually facing difficult situations that God is calling us back to him to find rest, to find the courage we need to keep going strong, the courage we need to step up in this faith, to our faith being built up so we could actually go and keep serving, keep going. There's a uh, story I used to tell at camps and in uh, various youth settings, and I want to share it here uh, This morning with you, there's a man who owned a bunch of land. And in this land, in the middle of his land, was a well. And it was a very deep well. And so the man thought, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill this well with dirt. So you're with me here? He's going to fill this well with dirt in the coming days. But what he also had was a bunch of animals and a couple camels. And over the course of his plan to fill that with dirt, the camel, was lollygagging around the field, tripped and fell into the well. Are you with me here? The camel's at the bottom of the well. The man is going to fill this well with dirt. We've got to get this camel out of here. That was for me. The camel's down there, doing however camels do at the bottom of that well, and so the man has his team come to fill this 
well with dirt, and they start taking their shovels and digging in and throwing in the dirt. Boom, 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 boom. And the camel's down there. He's, he's done screaming. He's done crying out. He thinks it's hopeless. He's probably at this time just sleeping. All of a sudden, he feels the first mound of dirt hit his back. And the second. What was that? And he shook off that dirt. He thought, oh, that's, that was just one time thing. How camels process these things? He's, they throw some more dirt on him. And the same situation applies. Doesn't know what's happening, but he shakes it off. Then after a, a few shovels of dirt, the camel realizes, and this was a brilliant camel, that as he shook off what was being thrown at him, it built a foundation for him to step up. So it's the uh, dirt came, the camel shook off the dirt, and then patted it down, stepped it up. More dirt came, he shook it off, and then he stepped up, and he kept going and going. By this time, he was catching a groove, shook it off, and he stepped up. He was just feeling so good, that camel. Shook, yeah, well, that, I'm going to get out of here. Shook it off, and he stepped up. So finally, he shook it off completely, stepped up, and stepped out. And the camel was saved, and he made it. Persevered through the dirt being thrown at him. And so, as we end here, I wonder if there are times, even maybe even this week, that some dirt has been thrown your way. Some hard things have been come your, your path. Your shoulders are feeling uh, weighed down by the burdens that you're facing. Jesus, through his power, when we're praying with him, when we're staying connected to God and others, when we're waiting for his time, will give us the bravery and the courage to do just what the camel did, shake off. Step into the next thing. Shake off. Follow Jesus closely. Step up to what he calls us to do. To go and be people who are known by our love and our service to one another, and our faith will grow. We'll have a building faith that points to Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our leader through this. Let's pray. God, thanks for your word. Thanks for the power of your scriptures. I pray that you would uh, continually remind us of who you are and your great love for us. Help us to have the uh, boldness to do just what was said out here, to spend time praying, to be uh, disciplined and committed to praying, to then be being disciplined and committed to staying connected to each other as we're growing in our relationship with you. And then give us the patience to wait for your time, wait for your plan, wait for your purposes. Help us not to run ahead, but to go with your pace and to go for your glory. So I pray as we uh, process this word, that it would fill our hearts so that we would take steps towards you in obedience to the things that you call us to. That we would get on the path with you and follow you uh, however you might lead and whatever timing you might do it. Help us to be people who pray, stay, wait, and then go serve. Thank you for Jesus and his great name.